Hello, I am Andreas Zilla. I'm the author of the debugging book, and I'm here to present you a new chapter. I think we are complete. Everybody is in. Happy to see all of you. Here we go. So <clears throat> I'm happy to see Konstantin joining me here for looking after our looking after our um, questions and answers. And before we get to the before we get to the next chapter or the next lecture, let me first ask whether there are any open questions from uh, last from uh, our last chapter. This was the chapter introduction to debugging. Maybe you might have a couple of questions that you might ask. And for this, you will find the Q and A. Uh, you're going to find the Q and A uh, window or button at the bottom of your Zoom window, which you can happily uh, which you can happily use to enter questions if there are any questions from the last from the last chapter. Remember things we did was among others. So let me just share my screen so that you can see things. So I can share, yes, here we go, wonderful. And we go over here, how cool is that? Wonderful, screen number three. And just to, just to remind you what you were supposed to read in the last week, well, or watch is this chapter on introduction to debugging in which we would uh, introduce this very simple uh, HTML, this very simple function to actually remove HTML markup and which happily would remove, which happily, which happily would remove HTML markup all day long. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't always work as expected. And your job for this week was actually to go and set up Jupyter and Python and check whether things would work just well. So I don't see anything in the chat window, nor do I see anything in our, nor do, nor do I see, nor did I see anything in our uh, question and answer window. So Johannes, Konstantin, anything from our forum that came up in interesting questions? Not really. Not really. Ah. How's that thing with Python? Whatever. How do you how do you do X in Python? How do you do Y in Jupyter? How do you install Jupyter? Anything like that? No. No. Um, not no, so far. No. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, if everything works so well, then we can I guess proceed right towards the next chapter. Any questions regarding oh, Brief assignment, brief announcement regarding assignments. We're currently finalizing the first project. This should go out by the end of the week. It's going to be some uh, some interactive time travel debugging. It's going to be super cool. We already have a small. <clears throat> we already do have a small prototype for that, and there's ample opportunities for you to refine this. Still no questions. Still no questions. No questions. Nothing. Okay, great. <clears throat> then we'll go right away to the then we'll go go right away to our next chapter. So here again is our uh, here again is our the function that we have been looking at. This is this remove HTML markup function, which is the which is the function that we're going to use for quite some number of experiments. <laughs> By the way, even the way it works right here, is not perfect yet. There are still ways to improve that and actually parsing HTML code uh, and parsing HTML markup or generally XML markup is actually quite a difficult task. So even the version that we have over here that uh, rudimentally handles uh, quotes and, uh, and uh, tag delimiters is not perfect yet. You can still improve over that in particular as it comes to escaping individual characters or as you uh, or as it uh, or as you come up with uh, individual uh, individual extra characters, Unicode characters, all of this can dramatically spoil your can dramatically spoil uh, <clears throat> things as it comes to uh, as it comes to trying out what happens in here. So, <clears throat> in this chapter, we are going to introduce so-called tracing. Tracing meaning that 
you are able to actually look at what the program is doing while it executes. So we're tracing the program execution. And I have to say this, if, there, if Python was the worst language in the world, which I think some uh, people actually uh, may agree with, even if Python were the worst language in the world, I would still be super happy to use it if only for its tracing capabilities. Tracing means that, you're act that you actually can go and uh, take an arbitrary, take an arbitrary uh, Python code and examine what happens while it executes. And for this, there's a single mechanism which we call a, uh, which we call a tracer function. And this tracer function can be invoked right within your program or more typically a debugger. And this allows you to actually track precisely what's going on. Let me show you how this works. So um, the, <clears throat> I'm going to set up a uh, traced version of our HTML markup function. I could also enable tracing right away here in the Jupyter Notebook, but this would actually, uh, this would actually get the entire Jupyter Notebook to be traced and that's not something you want to see. You're going to get plenty of, um, plenty of events that you're not interested in. And the interesting thing is you have a function that is called sysSetTrace. You have to do import sys, you have to do import sys beforehand. And this is the global debug tracing function, which will be called on each function call, actually on every line of the program. And with this, you can define a function to be called, say trace it. We come, we're going, going to come to trace it in a second. And then after you invoked, after you set up this trace it function, then you can go and um, invoke whatever you like. So you can run arbitrary um, Python code like this. Here we go. So we'll store the return value just to be sure. And when you're done with tracing, don't forget this, this is important. You have to turn it off again. So, and you can do this by passing none to it. And we complete the whole thing by returning red here. Okay, so that's very simple. So and the idea is now that this tracing function, trace it here, trace, oops, where are we? Trace it, no, oh, doesn't work properly. Oh, here we go, finally, oops. <laughs> this trace it function, yes, thank you very much. Will now be invoked auto will now be invoked automatically for each and every call in the program. And actually, you can also set this up to be called for each and every line in the program. What does such a trace it function look like? Well, let us define it. A tracing function takes um, a tracing function takes three arguments, and the first one is a frame. A frame is a data structure that contains the current variables of your program, uh, as, well as, the, as well as information about the current code that is being executed. The second argument to trace it is an event. This is something that tells you, this is a string that tells you what is currently happening in your program. This can be call, that is a function is called, this can be line and your line is executed or return that is the current function returns. And finally, you also have an extra, uh, an extra argument called arg. This is being used for additional information. Notably, if the function returns, then arg contains the argument. So what can we do with this? Well, very simple. Uh, we can say, okay, let's just print things out. Oh, the helpful print. Thank you so much now that we know that. So we can, for instance, print out the current event that's happening. And now in these, um, and now in this frame object, we can actually access a number of interesting, uh, interesting parts. Notably, we can access the current line number that is being executed. And that's all we do at this point. At the end, you can either return none, and then the trace it function will only be called with the next function call. Or you can also have uh, the whole thing return itself. And then if you, if you return the tracing function itself or actually any tracing function, 
then this function will be called for the next line too. So <clears throat> with these two functions, and now with these two functions actually, you can now go and build a full-fledged debugger. Well, a debugger. A debugger in the sense that you can see what's happening in your program. So if I now go and invoke this remove HTML markup traced XYZ, I will get a number of events. Let's see what this works. No, it doesn't. <laughs> You have to import this first, import this, then define trace it, then remove HTML markup. Yes, and we get quite a number of, well, we, we get all these, oh, now, what is this, all this stuff? Sister trace call 2007, 2020, this shouldn't work. So something weird in here because, uh, okay, let's start this whole thing from the beginning. That is going to make life a bit easier such that we do have, oh no. <laughs> Oops, so sorry. I think we still have the trace it function running for some reason. So I'm going to stop the whole thing and restart it right here to see what's going on. See, we are super, we are, <clears throat> ah, now this is much better already. <laughs> yeah, there, is, there has been some other, there has been some other uh, definition that, met, that messed up with ours. <clears throat> so what we have in the beginning here, as we see, we have an event called call. This is the call of remove HTML markup. And this happens in line 152. What is line 152? Here's line 152. This is where we are right now. And now we can see how the program actually progresses through the individual lines, 153, 54, 55, 57, and so on, until it uh, ends up in line 167. And then we make a jump back to 157 and 67, which is down here, and 57 actually mark the boundaries of the loop we are proceeding through. So this is not yet so, so super, well, so super, well, this is very raw still. So we cannot immediately see what is going on in our program right now. We still have to find out what these lines are and we have to look these up in our source code. Fortunately, there's way more things to be, fortunately, there's way more things to be done. Uh, by the way, uh, since we have a question here, this return trace it actually <clears throat> means that the trace it function is supposed to be called for the next line just as well. The alternative is to return none and then it will not be called until the next function is being called. So you have even more things to look at. For instance, what you also can do is you can look at uh, the current code and the current code is a code object, which is some binary blob, which is not going to be that super interesting. But what you can do is you can look up the current name of the function that is being called. And if we add this to our trace it function and now again execute it, um, okay, so we still need to define these things. Here we go. Okay, uh, if we now again execute it, then we will see, oh, we actually see the current, the name of the current function that is being executed. And even better than that, we can even in the current frame, look at the at all the local variables. This is a, a dictionary called a frame f.locals. And again, we can look this up. And now you will actually see that not only do we see the current name of the function, but we also see all the local variables starting with S, which is the argument to remove HTML markup, which it has the value X, Y, Z. <clears throat> then we get a variable named tag, which is false. We get a variable named quote, which is also false. And these are actually the variables as they're being set up here, tag equals false, quote equals false, and so on. And <clears throat> now we can go and actually even find out when these when the when does the value of tag change does it ever change actually well tag is false tag is false tag is false no 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 tag never changes quote never changes but out changes because we're processing one character at a time and we're accumulating these in the variable out so out in the beginning is empty then it has uh, the string x then we add y to it and finally it has the full string x y z which we also return at the very end and um, <clears throat> this is, so this is still, this is still very basic as you can see, um, but we can make things even better than that. 
So one interesting thing is that these local variables here is actually something that you can look up yourself. So you can actually access all these, all these variables as if they were Python ob because they actually come as a Python object that's created specifically for you, which means for instance, you can go and I want to, tr if you want to track only one variable, let's make that frame f of locals of s. And then the whole thing is going to print out, uh, well, only the value of the s variable. Okay, so that's, um, that's actually pretty convenient. Uh, in some variants of Python, I'm not sure where this works here, you can even assign new values to individual variables. So you can even say, I can even set the value of S to, well, whatever, uh, Qx, for instance. Not sure whether this has any effect in here, let's see. Yes, it works. So, oh, wow, <laughs> that's cool, actually. <laughs> This is the first time this worked. I'm super impressed. So here, they, here, in the, here in the tracer function, what we actually do is not only do we access individual variables, hey, we can also change their values on the fly while we're doing this. So initially, S had the value of X, Y, Z, and after it's being executed, it has the value of Q, X, and then the whole thing executes with Q, X till the very end. Assignment of variables, however, is not always possible in all Python variants, so don't rely on it. So this is very basic, this is very basic stuff. And of course, I can now say, I can now add additional parts to my tracing function. For instance, I can say if frame, so let's see, if we do have a variable named quote in frame f locals and um, frame dot f underscore locals quote, as a value of true. Ooh. Yeah, sort of. Does that work? No, actually, that's not how we do it because it actually is the quote variable. So we can do it this way. And then you can say something like uh, quote is set. Haha, <laughs> how cool is that? Okay, good. Let's see whether this works. Okay, do we have that at any point? Quote is set? No, because quote never becomes true. But if we do have something like, um, which version is that? Is that the buggy version or the working version? It's the, it's the working version. So let's make this uh, a href to foo.com, whatever, x, y, z, and we end this whole thing as a link. There we go. So now, as we process through this more complex HTML input, at some point, the quote variable should become true. So we first see the tag becomes true. That's already interesting because tag ha happens to be set over here. And now we all we have to do is to wait until this actually happens. So we proceed, we proceed, we proceed, we proceed, and now we have this extra, extra situation that quote has just been set. And now you can, of course, also remove the remaining logging up here. And then you can simply, then you can simply say quote is set. And you can also say, you can also move it this way, quote is set. And if otherwise, you can also say quote is not set. And since we're at this, you can also still inline frame f line no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> That's fun. It's no longer set. Inline, and again, we have frame f line number. So, and what do we get this way? Well, what we get is quote is not set in line 155 and it's set in line 157 and in line 157 it is no longer set and later it so we can actually track through the entire execution and then find out the path of the execution where the variable quote is being set so this is um, <clears throat> this is so th this gives you an enormous amount of flexibility during tracing because this allows you to actually, this allows you to actually locate um, precise events. When do things happen? What you also can do, of course, you can also say uh, while. You can also take this big print thingy here 
and then uh, track all variables at once while quote is being set. So this looks like this. And then you will get an inform information while quote is being set, you're going to get a trace. And while quote is not being set, you do not get a trace. So this allows you large flexibility as it comes to logging because you can always set up this tracing function as you like. So this allows you, so this tracing function allows you to access the current variables, the current line number, the current function. But for a true debugger, you also want to be able to actually access the uh, to actually access the current uh, source code. And how do you do that? Well, <laughs> again, it could be simpler. There is a module in Python which is called inspect. Import inspect. Here we go. And this inspect module actually allows you to get the source code of arbitrary of arbitrary objects. In particular. In particular, you can look up uh, the source code of uh, individual <coughs> individual uh, functions. So let me just see whether I can get this to run. So here we go. Let's see. Aha. So there's a function called inspect dot to get source lines, into which you can pass a function, <coughs> or actually also a code object, if I recall it right. And this returns two values, namely the content and the start line number <coughs> of, an end of, of a particular object. So let's stick with remove HTML markup for a moment, and then we can see what happens. And now you can go and, <coughs> and with that, you can now go and print out the current line number that is being executed. Let me see whether I can get this to run. So what is this? Um, so let me just check whether I'm able to do that. How do you do that? Um, ah, yeah, I have it. Okay, good. So let's not get to the source lines, but oh, does that work? Actually, this should be it already. So we can actually fetch the current line as being the line of the content that is in the current line number. Here we go. But since line numbers start with one, but arrays start with zero, I think we have to remove, have to have to have an offset of minus one here. And now this actually allows you to print out the, well, let's simply say the line number and the current line in of your, of, of the source code. Here we go. So let's keep let's keep fingers crossed and see whether this works. No, it doesn't. List index out of range. Why is that the case? List index out of range. Ah, uh, no. Sorry, I'm confused here. Ah, ha, yeah, I have it. Uh, we have to uh, the. Content is, of course, the first line of the source code, but we have to also take into account the starting line number, which in this our case here is 152. Fortunately, the starting line number is also being returned. So we, so we subtract the current starting line number. And do we still have to do minus one? That's a good question. If it starts in 152 and if we get 152, then it actually should be the current line. So here we go. And let's see. Yes. How cool is that? Uh, now we can, oh, that's not entirely perfect because there's still a, oh no, what we need to do here is we need to remove this extra line at the end. And now, <laughs> and now you can actually track through a trace to the entire program and for every single line, see the source code that is being executed right here. So first we have remove HTML, tag is false and so on. And now we actually loop through the program and the individual and the individual branches that are being taken one after the other until, well, until what happens? I think we're going through each character here. That's actually a very long input. And we can also see how the individual uh, variables are being set or at least the appropriate lines are being executed. In the end, the for loop is done, we return and we return the current, we could return the uh, return value of X, Y, Z. So things are just fun in here. And um, 
I'm going to keep things a bit shorter here such that we don't have such a super duper long execution run, so ABC, and then it actually well, fits on, then it actually fits on one screen. Of course, on top of that, on top of the current line, you can still say show the current variables. So again, this would be a frame, uh, frame, 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 F locals, if I recall it right, and there you go. And then, oops. And then, uh, yeah, I think we now have a mix here. Oh yeah, I see what I see where the problem is. <laughs> okay, let's do it this way. Okay, now now here we go. Now you can see actually each line that has been executed. You see the variables. You see the line that's being executed. The variables that hold. Actually, that's not perfect because the variables should be shown first because the state we're getting is the state before the current thing is executed. So let's put it up here, frame of locals. And now we actually, well, <laughs> almost perfect and almost perfect in here. And we do end still one little, oh, now we have it perfectly. So in the beginning, S is equal to ABC and we invoke this function. Uh, after we have invoked tag equals false, we have a variable named tag, which is false. After we invoke quote equals false, we have a variable that of quote being false and so on. So you see that um, there's actually plenty of ways that you can access what's happening in your program. You can access the current, um, you can access the current, um, you can access the current um, current line that is being executed. You can access the source code. Actually, the source code we're still cheating here a bit because the source code we're having is still the source code of always remove HTML markup. So I am pretty sure that we can also pass a code object in here such that this would be frame F code. So Let's see whether this works. Yes, this does just the same. And now, even if we jump into other functions, we are also going to get their source lines, assuming that there are source lines, of course. Okay, well, and based on this, based on this mechanism, in this chapter, we introduce an entire, we introduce an entire uh, mechanism that is a tracer class, which actually does these things pretty much automatically using a special format, which is the, this with statement. With is a construction in Python that allows you to execute a body of code while you're making sure that specific methods are being called at the entry and at the exit of the block. And we use these entry and exit functions to turn on uh, tracing and to turn off tracing. So this actually ensures that tracing is, call, is, is turned off at the very end of our tracing session. And with this tracing class, we can now go and well, do similar tricks as we did before, that is printing out the current function, printing out the, printing out um, current variables, accessing source code, all these things in here, tracing calls and <clears throat> tracing calls and returns, including, including things. And from there on, we can come up with more sophisticated tracers, such as <clears throat> tracing uh, variable changes, that is tracking whether some variable change in its, in its, in its current value. So this allows us to annotate uh, <clears throat> our output with only the change variables. This makes it far, far easier to read and to understand. And we can also come up with conditions that should, fulfill, should be fulfilled for tracing. <clears throat> this allows us <clears throat> to provide, <clears throat> sorry, specific conditions of interest that we're interested in, that we, that we want to trace during our execution, so a particular slice of the execution, say a character holds a particular value, a Boolean variable holds a particular value, and we introduce a conditional tracer, which allows us to actually, uh, to actually, to actually specify such a condition, which will then be evaluated on each and every line of code. And if it's, and if it's true, then it will actually, then the line will actually be printed out. Okay. Um, this is already pretty much all we're having in here. We also have an event tracer where you can specify specific events happening. 
And in the end, this is a bit more advanced. In the end, we can actually, we, I'm also showing how uh, to implement such tracers more efficiently. You can imagine that um, with some piece of code being executed each and every line, uh, the program execution slows down massively, and that's indeed true. It's uh, several hundred times slower. And so in the end, I'm introducing, I'm introducing a mechanism, well, that's actually a bit longer, that now goes and, in, that goes and dynamically inserts extra code into the program of choice, such that um, the tracing code is only executed at these very statements. This is actually similar to how a debugger in a conventional programming language such as C or Java works. They work by injecting, <clears throat> by injecting code into the machine code or bytecode to be executed. And <clears throat> I show that this is way more efficient, of course, but this is also a bit more limited because such um, tracing, turning on tracing, and turning off tracing is then uh, is then uh, limited to specific locations in the code, whereas with a general tracer that is executed with each line of the code, you can check for arbitrary conditions, not only things that happen to take place in the current line. These are all th these are all the things in the tracer, in this um, tracer part. Um, we also do have uh, a nice extra. A <clears throat> uh, couple of extra exercises on that. In particular, we do have syntax-based instrumentation, which actually allows you to turn a piece of code into a tree, a uh, so-called syntax tree, and then work on the syntax tree rather than on the character-based program code. This is, uh, this is super advanced, and you can have lots and lots of fun with that. And I also very much uh, encourage you to go through that. As usual, I would very much like you to try out this all by yourself and do your own experiments with it and maybe try this out on your own code. And <clears throat> this is already all we're having for this chapter and of course for your assignment for the upcoming week. Thank you for your attention. And I was happy to present you this tracer chapter. With this, I'm happy to take questions. What do we have in terms of questions? Johannes, you have been monitoring the chat and the Q&A session. Yep. Um, so there were some questions about the projects themselves. Mm -hmm. So the first question was whether it's possible to publish dates for projects. Yes, the first project will be out um, on by the end of this week and will be due in three weeks. The other projects will then also follow with uh, uh, with dates on three with approximately three weeks later each for each project. Okay. Um, the next question is um, again regarding the projects whether we uh, provide the students with a mock up of uh, an interactive UI uh, for the debugging tool. Um, um, so that they know which um, features are expected from them. Um, actually, uh, actually, actually, we're working on this right now. So last week, I built a very small mockup for what could be expected. Um, this is something we're only going through in the next week, but I can give you a very sneak peek on things on what things look like. So I'm still sharing the screen. This is the chapter that we're going to look at next week. And this is the chapter that you will be building your interactive debugger on. And while the gist of the, of the chapter is about interactive debugging, uh, in the very end, there is an exercise which actually <laughs> seems it's all command line debugging, not super exciting. But um, here's, a, here's a super small example on how you can record an, how you can record an interaction. And then uh, with this interaction, we provide a slider. And this slider then allows you to look the to look up the individual lines of code as they were executed, and show the values of the individual variables. This is very basic stuff still. So you can see well. This is just for you to get acquainted with things, uh, just to see what individual lines are being executed, which variables exist. This uses the same mechanism as the tracer we've seen before, only in a maybe more fancy way, and. Uh, 
this is an example of a very, very simple, of a super, super simple uh, graphical user interface for a debugger. So this thing here now uses, um, uses actual HTML and JavaScript. And this is something which you can also use as a template to start with. Um, but, we are, but we're also currently investigating the usage of specific uh, Jupyter uh, widgets, which allow, you to do, which allow you to achieve similar things without the usage of HTML and JavaScript. So if you know HTML and JavaScript, you can use these, com you can use combinations like these for building a graphical user interface. And you can also use, uh, and you can also use uh, the Jupyter widgets in order to achieve this, or hey, you can just go with an, um, or you can just go and uh, you and do the project as a single person and then come up with commands such as assign, backward, forward, all these things. Okay. Um, then I will just um, read some questions from the chat. Um, there was a question whether uh, the trace, uh, whether the tracer is an equivalent to um, creating traps in C or C plus plus. Yeah, that's actually a good question. So, in, if you have a, if you have a, if you want to build a tracer for a compiled language such as C or C plus plus, well, you are in for a couple of weeks, if not months, of serious hacking. The thing is that um, in the compiled code the original information about, about the source code or the individual variables that existed is all gone by default because it has been compiled into machine code. So you have to come up with plenty of information. This is the so-called debugging information that needs to be compiled or at least added to your executable program. And this debugging information then creates a mapping between individual memory locations in C, for instance, and the original uh, source value, source variables, and their types and their locations and everything in the original source code. Also, this also establishes mappings between uh, uh, program counters in your machine code and original sources and source lines. All of this information has to be extracted from the executable, has to be has to be applied, has to be traced back. This is what a regular debugger. Uh, like the like GDB or LLDB do for you, and um, and this is um, and this is uh, very complicated to set up. Uh, you also have to instrument the compiler such that it adds all this information. You have to set up a debugger such that it extracts this information and and getting all of this to run is extremely difficult. So building a debugger like <laughs> GDB or LLDB. Uh, from scratch is going to set you back several months at least. Whereas in Python, accessing all this information is there at your fingertips. That's a, that's a great advantage of such an interpreted language. And this is actually the one feature that actually allows us to build all these automated techniques that we're looking up in this course. Okay, um, there's another question. Um, you earlier mentioned that there may not be uh, that there may not be source code for a certain line. How is that possible? And do we need to consider this possibility in our projects? Uh, uh, of course, say if uh, the source code cannot be found, if the source code cannot be found, well, then you show no source code. At least your program shouldn't crash simply because there is no source code to be found. But um, your pro, but your um, but your debugger, of course, should be able to handle such situations great, uh, gracefully. OK, um, there are still more questions, but there is also an attendee who raised his hand, uh, maybe. Go ahead. I, I just don't know how to. Ah. I, I don't think I can unmute this person. <laughs> I think that's something you have to do as host. Something I have to do, really. OK, one second. Uh, let me just. Stop sharing my screen here. Ooh. You sure that somebody raised his hand? I don't see anyone. Okay. Yeah, so Zoom says there's Jonas uh, raising his hand. It's very simple. I just made you co-host, Johannes, and now you can do anything that I can do with this stuff. OK, so apparently he just lowered his hand again. <laughs> <laughs> right when I wanted to click on him. Good. OK. So well, we have more questions then still. Yeah, we have more questions. Um, 
So I think this is kind of a follow-up question. Um, is it possible to create a debugger of this type on embedded devices that run micro Python as, uh, as its firmware? Um, of course you can. Uh, the only thing is that of course your debugger then has to be compiled into the final program as is the case with these uh, suit of set trace and similar functions. And then um, the typical way to Typical way to deal with that is that you set up a separate, that you set up a special channel, a special port, or whatsoever, in order to run, in order to get access to debugging information. The true challenge actually is to 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 run uh, to run a debugger on uh, on hardware programs. That's really that's 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 really super difficult. Because regular debuggers work indeed by instrumenting the code, by inserting special um, by inserting special instructions that uh, jump back into the debugger code while the program is executing. And if your program is in hardware or if your program is in ROM, then your debugger has no chance of doing that. And then you need to come up with super special tricks, in particular um, using processor processor features such as. Uh, Having the execution stop when a particular location is reached, these are, these, these are called these are so-called hardware breakpoints. Um, <clears throat> then things get really, really complicated. But again, fortunately, in our course, we are more focusing on uh, on getting the basic principles and the algorithms of automatic debugging right, so we don't have to deal with all these nasty details. Okay. Um... Then there is another question. Um, would you later cover UI debugging with stepping into or stepping over functions? Yes, of course. We do have the next chapter, which is uh, the debugger chapter, where we go into interactive debugging. And there, actually, one of the exercises is to implement a function that allows you to step over a to step over an execution. Actually, that's uh, pretty straightforward if you think of it, because um, let me just share my screen here again because if you think if you see this um, if you can see this um, trace it function that unhappily goes and is being invoked here um, the thing is that this is called with an event which is called which is uh, which can be either a single line being executed or a call being executed and if you want this trace it function to not to do anything, before the function returns, then all you need to do is, oh, I just called another function, and then I'm not going to do anything until it returns. So you can either have the trace it function check what the current status is, whether you're stepping into a function or whether you'd like to step over a function, and um, then the trace it function would be set up such that it record such that it reports things only if uh, only when the current function returns. Okay, um, there's another question and that is, does the .NET framework or Java runtime provide similar features of accessing debugging data as the, uh, at the, same, as the same complexity degree uh, as Python does it? Is that, a state, is that a statement or is that a question? No, that is a question. So whether those frameworks uh, and the Java runtime provide those features. The Java runtime provides a couple of debugging features, and it's also and there's also interfaces for debugging, but it's not nearly as easy to use as the Python feature. Your mileage may vary. Show me show how show me how to implement a, a tracing function that gets you access to all to the current source code and the current and the current variables and and, and the current um, current source code, the current the values of our variables in Java in less than 10 lines and I will fall to my knees. Okay, there are two more questions. So the first question is whether we could have a Discord room or something similar. And I think the answer to that would be that we have the forum, which was our intention to use that as kind of the same thing. There's a forum um, which allows you to immediately post things. You don't have to register or anything. It's also it's also it's also provided by us and not a third party thingy, so very simple. You go to the forums that are provided. Yeah, um, and then there is another question regarding errors that are thrown when running the Jupyter notebooks. And to that, I would say just 
write uh, this in the forum and explain a bit more what the exact errors are so we can actually help you better with this. I think yes, the general answer is so, yeah, so first you need to first you need to download all notebooks in the very beginning and only then can you download individual notebooks on top of that because downloading all notebooks gets you a bit of infrastructure in particular modules such as the, the book utils module which is used by pretty much every notebook and then um, a couple of these notebooks also use extra features um, i think we so for instance in order to show in order to convert a um, program into a syntax tree and to visualize that we have extra modules but the simple answer is if you if you wanted to import x and then x is not found all you need to do is pip install x and then it will come along automatically okay um there is one last question and that is when do we have to start working on our projects as soon as the assignment is out which will be by the end of the week okay i mean you can also start later i don't uh, i don't know when you uh, i don't care when you start but i care when you should be done because there will be a deadline for each of these projects yeah so for now, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Well, that was quick. If there's no further questions, then thank you very much for attendance. I have a few moments left till the next uh, till the next meeting comes up, so I should be able to post the video of our of this very lecture in within the next hour. If not, it will be online tomorrow morning with YouTube and everything. So thank you very much. Enjoy interacting with the Python trace it function and the tracer classes that we provide. And these will then form the base for our interactive debugger, which we're going to look at, which we're going to look at uh, in the next week. And the debugger chapter already is, is, is ready already, so you can also do a peek into the chapter that follows, such that you have an idea of what your project will be and what you will have to build. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to, thank you very much, everybody. And I'm going to see all of you next week. Bye-bye.